I am delighted to welcome you to a new seminar of our uh, speaker series called Atomic Voices. And the scope of the Atomic Voices series is really to create an intellectual space where we can discuss uh, issues of diversity, belonging, inclusion. And our understanding of diversity, inclusion, and belonging is a broad understanding. It's uh, uh, making sure that new voices are added at the table of nuclear discussions, but it is also our intention to bring new topics to uh, the debate and to highlight new work, innovative work, that might actually sit a little bit outside of the conventional debates we are having, especially here in the United States. And for this reason, I am particularly delighted today to moderate an event that we have titled Redressing Nuclear Harm, Transitional Justice in the Nuclear Age. And of course, this couldn't be a more timely um, topic. Uh, the Marshall Islands has just concluded an important agreement to receive compensation from the United States over the environmental and humanitarian cost of their uh, nuclear test program. Uh, we have also lived and we are living in an age where the nuclear uh, use threats is becoming, uh, unfortunately, quite common in the public discourse. And so thinking about justice and the victims of nuclear threats, nuclear use is extraordinarily important. And for this reason today, we are particularly pleased to welcome two, or I would say of the top experts that have spent quite some time thinking about this issue. And these are Dr. Caroline Fell, Senior Research at the Peace Research Institute in Frankfurt, and Sasha Hach, a Research Associate at the Peace Research Institute in Frankfurt. I have to mention that they are the co-authors of a really important report that we'll make um, available uh, in, the, in the link in the chat called Beyond the Ban, a Global Agenda for Nuclear Justice. We were supposed to have our third co-author, uh, Jana Baldus, but she's unfortunately sick. And so we will shorten a little bit the time of the event, but we decided to go ahead because we, we really treasure their expertise and the topic that we want to discuss together. Now, let me also mention that we asked Caroline and Sasha to give seven to 10 minutes opening remarks. Then I will pose a few questions, more like broad setting questions. And then we will turn to the audience who has always been very active and very involved in the previous Atomic um, Voices series for your own questions that you can actually write in the chat. Now, let me turn to Dr. Fell for the introduction and the presentation of this great report they just released. Over to you, Caroline. Thank you, thank you for your introduction. Uh, let me first ask, is it okay if we go a little longer because we tried to cover up for Jana's a part that she was going to talk about as well, since we didn't want to miss out on the nuclear testing issue, which is really important. Great, so let me share my screen. Hopefully this works. Is it working? Yes, sorry, it was supposed to start here. Okay, so thank you for having us. Um, as was just mentioned, um, we'd like to share some ideas that are based firstly on this report uh, released in 2021, but also on a, an article that we've been working on more recently. Um, and I'll start with introducing the general idea behind this joint project and its analytical framework, which distinguishes four pillars, what we call four pillars of nuclear justice. I'll talk about the first and second pillar, legal accountability and redress, and Sasha will then turn to the third and fourth pillar, truth-seeking and non-recurrence. And uh, for some very quick background, as was already mentioned, um, we're seeing intense discussions about how to avoid the future use of nuclear weapons, including in the context of Ukraine. Uh, but there's much less public awareness and interest in uh, the harm that nuclear weapons have already caused to hundreds of thousands of people, both through their use in World War II and through decades of nuclear testing. Uh, and we have seen, however, that this past harm has been receiving increasing attention among analysts, uh, as illustrated, I think, by this series and also by a range of new publications that I can only illustrate here and not discuss in any detail. But I want to flag that they include a lot of diverse case studies of nuclear harm, 
and uh, reflect a diversity of analytical angles also. Some focus on human harm, others on environmental dimensions of nuclear harm, and yet others analyze both of these through a decolonial theoretical lens. And we find these diversity of uh, perspectives also reflected in some more general publications that discuss nuclear harm as a global issue, transcending um, individual cases. And in tune with this uh, new wave of research, uh, the task of dealing with uh, past nuclear harm has also been rising on the international political agenda, both in bilateral contexts as the uh, compact of free association between the US and the Marshall Islands, and in, uh, in global discussions, for example, as part of the TPL and W's uh, positive obligations that we'll talk about later. So we basically add to this recent analytical and political move by proposing to understand um, the past harm caused by nuclear weapons as historical injustice and legal and political efforts to come to terms with this harm as a special case of transitional justice. Now, it might at first seem a little bit odd to use this concept, which we're familiar with from, for example, Latin American or Southeastern European societies emerging from autocracy or emerging from civil war to grapple with the legacy of mass human rights violations. But what we argue is that at a closer look, this task of addressing the past harm from nuclear weapons actually shares many features with these more familiar contexts. And most importantly, uh, the task uh, or the, the harm caused by nuclear weapons um, is a case of systemic wrongdoing, uh, meaning that like, for example, human rights violations by an autocratic regime, nuclear harm was committed on behalf uh, of governments and their political systems. It was regarded by these actors as legal or at least legitimate in terms of their existing norms at the time, but it was judged as illegal or immoral by later generations following normative change. And in the case of nuclear weapons, this normative change has come, for example, through the evolution of international humanitarian law, but also through the nuclear test ban. And finally, as with these other transitional contexts, dealing with nuclear violence as systemic injustice requires special processes that go beyond the boundaries of normal uh, criminal law and also beyond the boundaries of law as such. So the transitional justice framework is fitting because nuclear harm is systemic wrongdoing. And it's also fitting because these four pillars associated with transitional justice actually capture very well what uh, communities of nuclear victims have been demanding historically and presently. So if we use this framework, what is the change compared to other ways of talking about past nuclear harm? And why do we think it could be useful? The first argument is that speaking about nuclear justice, um, rather than using terms like uh, assistance or support, draws attention to the rights of victims and it reframes the task of coming to terms with this past nuclear harm from being an act of charity, which is how it's usually presented, to being a duty for nuclear states that have caused the harm. And a second argument is that this four pillar framework can be used as a comparative tool to identify gaps, things that have not been done uh, with regard to nuclear weapons, although they are pretty standard in other contexts of historical harm. And thus we can expose also inconsistencies between the support that states like France have lent to transitional justice in many contexts, but not with regard to their own nuclear past. And this, uh, this comparative approach also facilitates the task of connecting nuclear justice to other causes like the broader debate about uh, colonial injustices. And as this last point indicates, we do not intend our framework to replace other analytical lenses on nuclear harm, but uh, we think it can be brought into a fruitful conversation with them, which is what we're elaborating on in this article we're working on. So the basic idea is uh, very simple to take these four pillars that are widely agreed as being the essential components of transitional justice and to analyze for each pillar what has been done to address past injustice caused by nuclear weapons. And the UN approach to transitional justice as outlined in this guidance note by the, by the UN Secretary General consists of these four elements, criminal prosecution, truth, which includes also the acknowledgement of guilt in the form of apologies, redress or reparations, and fourthly, legal reform, 
with the aim of ensuring the non-recurrence of crimes. Um, the first pillar, individual criminal accountability, is the least developed pillar with regard to nuclear harm. No individual has ever been held criminally responsible for the use of nuclear weapons in Hiroshima or Nagasaki or for uh, acts or harm uh, done by nuclear testing. After World War II, the fact that the Tokyo trials did not even deal with the atomic bombings reflected on one hand the focus of these trials on Japanese crimes against peace, but it also reflected the, the lack at the time of clear legal norms prohibiting so-called morale bombings. Nevertheless, even at the time, there was some dissent with the view that uh, the bombings, the atomic bombings had been legal. Uh, it was Judge Powell, an Indian judge at the Tokyo trials who expressed this opinion in his famous dissent uh, with the uh, tribunal's judgment. And in 1963, a Japanese district court ruled in the Shimoda case, also a famous case, that the bombing had been illegal in light of existing conventions and draft norms of air warfare, uh, because this was not a criminal trial, but a civil lawsuit, it didn't have any immediate implications for actual individual liability, although, as we, uh, we will hear, uh, it had some political repercussions. Today, this, the situation is uh, much clearer. Both the Geneva Convention's additional protocols and the International Court of Justice's 1996 advisory opinion have made it or make it very clear that practically any conceivable use of nuclear weapons in conflict would be illegal under contemporary international humanitarian law. And it's also likely that individuals responsible for such transgressions would be held criminally liable. Uh, and that's although efforts to explicitly include nuclear weapons in the statute of the International Criminal Court or in its code of crimes have failed due to the resistance of nuclear powers. Even uh, nuclear weapons are not uh, explicitly mentioned. It would be hard to imagine any use of nuclear weapons that would not fall under the Rome Statute's definition of war crimes or crimes against humanity. And uh, this liability would potentially relate not only to the human harm, but also to environmental harm caused by nuclear weapons. If there's interest in this um, aspect, I could say more about it in the Q&A. Um, with regard to nuclear testing, the situation is a bit different. There's some arguments that uh, nuclear testing could constitute crimes against humanity under certain conditions and would don thus fa fall in the future under the ICC's jurisdiction. That is much more uncertain. But uh, you could argue that the increasing use of universal jurisdiction trials in national courts to prosecute international crimes opens at least a, a possibility for suing any individuals responsible for future hypothetical nuclear tests in these national courts based on the human rights violations associated with such tests. So that was the first pillar. The second pillar, redress, has really been central to nuclear victim struggle for justice. And it's also here where we've seen the most progress. And this progress has come through national or bilateral aid and compensation schemes, which uh, generally have been institutionalized as a result of victims' long-standing legal and political struggles. And here are some examples. So in Japan, the Bakusha struggle for redress um, has involved civil lawsuits against the Japanese state, such as the already mentioned Shimoda case. In that case, the court uh, said that plaintiffs were not entitled to receiving individual compensation by the Japanese state, but it stated that the Japanese government should provide adequate relief measures for the survivors, and thus it gave a real boost to their political struggle for, uh, for aid. And through this combination of legal and political pressure, the Baksha have succeeded by gradually over the decades in expanding aid legislation, culminating in the latest 1995 um, law. And similarly, in the US case, the US Congress has enacted the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act in 1990 as a political measure uh, benefiting US residents affected by nuclear weapons after unsuccessful lawsuits by downwinders in various contexts against the federal government. Same scheme again in France, 
where litigation and political pressure by nuclear test veterans and affected communities, in this picture, a group of activists uh, from French Polynesia, led to the adoption of the so-called Loi Morin in 2010, which grants compensation to French test victims. Now, if we compare these different uh, national schemes, um, we see that they're very extremely widely in scope, both in terms of their funding and in terms of the number of individuals reached. Japan has instituted by far the most comprehensive program, followed by the US and France. But there's not only inequality between the nuclear powers, but also inequality across situations and uh, victim groups or categories. So the US has spent much more on compensating its own citizens than on supporting the Marshall Islands. Under the French program, Algerians have received almost no compensation as opposed to French citizens. And um, while all the nuclear weapon states, except interestingly the UK, compensate their nuclear test veterans, a civilian population, civilian victims have found it much harder to uh, get to be eligible for compensation. And what our table also shows is that even with regard to the most comprehensive programs, there are ongoing legal and political struggles. So even in these cases, victims really do not at all accept the question of redress as being settled. And these limits of existing redress measures and their unevenness mirror a number of fundamental problems. The first very obvious one is the post-colonial power asymmetries that shine through in, uh, in, in, in most of these uh, cases, if not all of them. The second issue relates to the governance of nuclear knowledge uh, or to the, in other words, to the secrecy, the government secrecy surrounding the impacts of nuclear weapons use and testing. And in some cases like the UK, we're seeing a flat denial of any nuclear harm caused by these tests. Um, the ongoing contestation of these narratives and of government secrecy relies very much on new scientific evidence coming out these recent years about the nuclear harm that these tests have caused. There are a lot of interesting studies that have recently been released. And a third is the technical problem, but which is, of course, influenced by these political issues. And that's that these programs create high thresholds of proof for people seeking to demonstrate they have been affected by nuclear weapons. For example, the Loi Morin contains a very narrow definition of who counts as a nuclear victim. And um, they also usually focus narrowly on medical conditions as opposed to the loss of relatives, psychological trauma, social ostracism experienced by the victim, so cultural damage they have experienced. All these forms of damage are not redressed. And there are also two other important gaps in this redress pillar. And uh, the first is that environmental remediation and compensation for environmental damage has been even more neglected than uh, redressing human harm. And the second gap is that uh, international courts have thus far not been used to press for compensation. Whether that's compensation to individuals as uh, granted by regional human rights courts or state to state compensation as adjudicated uh, by the ICJ. So why were not international lawyers, big caveat, uh, caveat we believe that uh, there may in fact be quite a large uh, unexplored potential for strategic litigation here at the global level in case that political efforts to expand these national and bilateral programs fail. That is sort of a bit of an outlook in the future of this uh, pillar. And uh, now I hand it over to Sasha, who will tell us a bit about the third pillar she's telling. Yeah, uh, the third pillar, uh, well, we have touched a little bit um, upon it um, already because it is closely linked to the redress and uh, compensation uh, pillar. Uh, it consists actually also of two parts. On the one hand, um, truth finding, and on the other hand, um, apology. Uh, for atrocities committed uh, and with uh, regard to uh, truth telling there have been um, as Caroline has also, uh, already mentioned a systematic and in part still ongoing efforts uh, of nuclear weapon states to conceal or play down the impact of nuclear weapons use and testing which makes it more difficult for victims to prove that uh, health issues are a result actually from radioactive contamination and to claim for uh, compensation, but it also denies victims a public recognition of their suffering and their right to medical truth 
which is a very important component in the conceptual framework of uh, transitional justice. Uh, next slide. Uh, to give an historical example, um, can you switch slides? Sorry, I'm trying, but ah. somehow <laughs> it's not working. Maybe I have to... Just click on it. Very good. Now, yeah. Is it uh, working? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so one historical example is the Atomic uh, Bomb Casualty uh, Commission set up after the bombings uh, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, but there's, there are similar cases uh, uh, with regard to nuclear weapons testing, like the examinations um, undertaken by the U.S. Atomic Energy Agency at the Marshall Islands. So uh, after the bombing, uh, the U.S. government set up this uh, commission to investigate the human uh, damage caused by the bombings. Interviews were conducted with uh, victims um, to study medical and biological effects of uh, radiation. But this commission adopted a formal non-treatment policy, which was actually often routinely violated by uh, the doctors. And the reason for this policy um, was that US authorities were concerned that treatment could actually be perceived as an atonement uh, for the bombings, as an admission of a wrongdoing or the illegality. And we have a similar situation with regard to nuclear testing, an important role of secrecy or denial uh, on the effects of nuclear testing while undertake, actually undertaking med medical examinations. So there was interesting interest in the truth, in evidence, in, 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 in fact findings, but not in sharing it and acknowledging uh, the damage course or the harm course. Uh, and this is why there are also accusations from the local populations uh, that uh, they have been abused as uh, Guinea uh, pigs for, for those kind of uh, research and examinations. Uh, with regard to France, uh, there was like, I think two years ago, the Stora report, which has been published on the legacy of French colonialism in Algeria, and it recommends investigating the consequences of French nuclear tests in Algeria. But as far as I know, nothing more has happened yet. So if there is a chance on advancing uh, there on a governmental level, it will be linked uh, with uh, uh, the efforts uh, to, uh, um, to deal with uh, the legacy of colonialism. Uh, on the contrary, uh, a French exhibition at the United Nations on testing in French Polynesia uh, was more sort of an image campaign, which gave the impression that the damage uh, had been repaired, that nuclear testing you know, was uh, presented as a legitimate practice, having taken on a place in isolated, remote, uninhibited uh, places uh, under all necessary standards, not presenting any health risks to the indigenous population and so on. Uh, so who fills this uh, transparency uh, gap? Uh, it's mostly academics and activists uh, that have played an important part in bringing uh, to light about nuclear weapons impact. Uh, but of course, this uh, work uh, remains work in uh, progress. Uh, we have in the beginning, in the introduction, um, pointed out to the Morora files from uh, Sebastian Philippe, uh, talks on Casanova about nuclear testing in uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, but there have been also more and more studies commissioned by states affected by nuclear weapons testing uh, the Marshall Islands, Kazakhstan, New Zealand, and Australia. And of course, this seminar, Atomic Voices, is also a, a contribution to truth finding and especially um, uh, making public um, uh, what has uh, happened, uh, associations of victims and affected people uh, that we have also met and talked to, uh, presented their experiences and uh, findings, but also addressed the problem of lacking information due to uh, classified uh, documents that have not been shared uh, with them on the test sites, for example, the precise locations, et cetera. Um, and we noted also that there are uh, studies and reports on the issue by the Harvard Law School International Human Rights uh, Clinic. So these, just to give uh, a couple of examples of this uh, civil society and academ uh, academia engagement uh, in this uh, uh, field of truth finding. With regard to apologies, uh, the balance sheet looks actually worse. The Japanese government policy uh, still uh, fails to meet the longstanding demand of uh, the Hibakusha uh, that the government shall accept a formal legal responsibility of the bombing. And also on the US side, um, uh, US president visited uh, uh, the uh, sites of uh, Hiroshima in 2016 
he acknowledged the suffering uh, caused by the bombings, but there was no uh, excuse. Uh, and uh, same, uh, no formal apologies from nuclear weapon states for effects of nuclear weapons testing, with the exception of the US apology to its own citizens in the context of the Radiation Exposure Compensation Acts. Uh, so communities in the US that, that were affected by tests on US territory uh, are the only ones that have received apologies and more comprehensive uh, compensation co a consequence, but not, for example, Marshall Islanders. Um, oh yeah, and here on the uh, picture, you see a French president, uh, Macron, visiting uh, French Polynesia in 2000. 21, where he acknowledged the suffering and what had happened, said that he had heard the claims uh, for compensation, but there was no uh, apology either. And the issue of non-apology is uh, very important because it is closely linked to the redress uh, pillar and uh, because there is a difference between uh, aid and voluntary you know, contributions or assistance uh, and uh, compensation and the question of redress and state reparations to uh, to um, justified rights. Uh, I would come to the fourth pillar, non-recurrence and uh, legal reform in the transitional justice framework. Efforts to seek justice for past wrongdoings would remain incomplete without the attempt to also draw lessons for the future and assure non-recurrence of uh, those atrocities. Uh, in the usual practice, this fourth pillar of uh, reform and non-recurrence refers to the national legal system in uh, tr transitioning societies or, or to national measures to prevent future atrocities, whether in the security sector or in other areas of society. So it is not so easy to apply to nuclear uh, weapons or at the international level. However, we tried to highlight some measures that have been undertaken to uh, prevent uh, use or testing on the national and international uh, level, and that can be uh, regarded or analyzed with the transitional uh, lens, uh, justice lens. Um, of course, like such measures can also be viewed from different perspectives, like an arms control perspective uh, or an international security lens, um, because uh, they also uh, you know, try to restrict nuclear weapons use. So what's the value added of a transitional justice uh, lens? Uh, here we can um, see maybe in the next slide. Um, thanks. Um, so on the one hand, it helps to better identify agency patterns when it comes to uh, legal reform efforts. Uh, if driven by an impetus to restore justice, it is usually not the nuclear weapon states. I say usually because there are some efforts also, but very limited. Uh, but uh, normally it's the non-nuclear weapon states, associations of victims uh, and affected people, civil society, academia, that push for legal change. And in those cases, when the, the issue of justice is involved, this involves also far more far-reaching demands or initiatives for reform or even transformation than in contrast if nuclear weapon states or umbrella states um, initiate arms control improvement, uh, they tend to develop uh, it in such a way that it does not limit their own options too much, so it's more status quo oriented in comparison. Uh, second, uh, with regard to the uh, discourse, uh, we can see a shift in discourse when nuclear justice is incorporated in the sense that it is a level of empowerment uh, that unfolds through more self-confident uh, language with the concept of rights, justified claims, what that's just what uh, Caroline has um, pointed out to in, in the beginning, but also the idea of justice as a common good or even a common public uh, good. We have observed in our study that the demands for disarmament or non-recurrence have been even more prominent political demands by victims, uh, communities and associations than demands for redress uh, or compensation, at least when it comes to the multilateral uh, level, they insisted that they want this never to happen again, etc., pushing for legal uh, reform. Uh, and third, uh, the transitional uh, justice lens is also related to very specific assessment uh, on uh, deterrence. Um, uh, with the nuclear justice perspective, uh, we have emphasized more on the logic of nuclear restraint 
than the logic of uh, nuclear deterrence. Both philosophies uh, claim to be aimed at avoiding future nuclear war, but uh, from a uh, uh, transitional justice perspective, deterrence is ultimately not compatible with non-recurrence because it relies precisely on the threat of recurrence. Otherwise, it would not have uh, any impact. So it's essentially at least questioned. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples uh, that uh, we have found. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so as I've said, uh, there are less efforts on uh, to be observed um, on the side of nuclear weapon states, but we have still um, found uh, some improvements on the national level, some progress um, today in many uh, uh, nuclear weapon states legal analysis prior to operations, military operations, including the nuclear options is a, a common practice, particularly in the United States. Uh, military plans have to be reviewed by members uh, of the Judge Advocates General Corps. Leading military officials are trained in the law of uh, armed conflict, uh, and the US nuclear doctrine also considers or, or places considerable um, uh, importance to uh, humanitarian law. So these are all can be interpreted as measures that restrict uh, the use uh, of uh, future use of nuclear weapons. One could also discuss whether a no first use policy or practice could be interpreted as a first step measure to non-recurrence, but this is uh, debatable. On international level, we distinguish three dimensions of uh, promotion of uh, non-recurrence. On the one hand, regarding the evolution of the of broader international legal frameworks, such as the evolution of international humanitarian law, as uh, Caroline has already pointed out, the international criminal law, etc. We also look at uh, legal struggles, specific legal struggles in international judicial bodies uh, to achieve a confirmation of the illegality of using or testing nuclear weapons as the ICJ advisory opinion in 1996. Um, and we examine international norm building efforts uh, uh, that aim at constraining or even preventing the use and testing of nuclear weapons. Um, examples could be uh, the establishment of nuclear weapons free zones, uh, the efforts to obtain negative security guarantees. So these could all be interpreted as legal measures or reform attempt, uh, attempts, or also the comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty, which is a major instrument uh, for non-recurrence of nuclear testing. And finally, of course, uh, not a surprise, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, next and last slide, uh, <clears throat> which is on the one hand probably the most comprehensive effort for legal reform, and on the other hand, one that has clearly been driven by uh, uh, justice uh, motivations. Um, yeah, as it prohibits both use and testing and other related activities, um, uh, nuclear weapons related activities, it clearly aims at non-recurrence. And this is also formulated in its uh, preambula uh, as it states that the goal of the treaty, the complete elimination of nuclear weapons, I quote, remains the only way to guarantee that nuclear weapons are never used again. So um, um, classic non-recurrence language. Another feature in the pre preambula of the treaty is the, the emphasis on the promotion of nuclear disarmament education, which is also in the uh, concept of transitional justice, a classical measure for prevention of uh, future atrocities, education for the general population. Um, and the treaty um, addresses the accountability gap with uh, Article 6 and 7, uh, the positive obligations on victims' assistance and environmental Remediations, uh, states, parties commit themselves within their own jurisdictions, and Article 7 tries to involve also other states within the treaty community, but also polluter states, which of course is more difficult as they are not parties to the treaty. However, um, uh, state parties to the TPNW are working uh, on um, you know, having a broader impact also in this field uh, beyond the, 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 the TPNW, states parties has established a working group uh, on the subject of victims' assistance and environmental remediation uh, at the first meeting of state parties. And it was, uh, I think, also an important uh, backup for this most recent uh, resolution of the United Nations General Assembly on the legacy of nuclear we weapons, victims' assistance, and environmental remediation 
uh, that is also a signal um, that they continue to push for implementation in this field, uh, stay, remain an active political force, and uh, that we can assume that they could initiate further nuclear justice related reforms in the future. Uh, so in some, um, you can see um, with the non-recurrence pillar, we get a little bit to an intersection where nuclear justice is connected to the broader agenda of nuclear arms control, disarmament, non-proliferation and risk reduction. But from another angle, uh, with another focus in terms of agency, discourse, um, deterrence, but also uh, with regard to the very content of specific legal measures or reform uh, initiatives. And uh, yeah, that's uh, the end of my part. Fantastic. All right, so we have roughly, I would say, 45 minutes. Uh, I see um, several people online who have studied uh, social justice, environmental justice. So I'm pretty sure uh, uh, some of our participants will have questions. And I ask you guys to put them in the chat and I will uh, make sure to raise them. But let me just bring up a few points. So when I when I read the report and also listened to your presentation, it is very clear that there is great variation among nuclear weapon states on how these countries deal with their nuclear legacy. I think it comes very much across uh, you know, your report that there is a sense of very uncomfortable uh, emotions about nuclear legacy, but these countries have put together various responses. Some are more okay maybe with the redress, some are more okay with the compensation question. And so I wonder whether you can give us a sense of uh, whether you have found a typology of responses or how do you explain this variation across, for example, the United States and France. And it's quite shocking what you have reported about the United Kingdom <clears throat> that normally we consider one of the most liberal <clears throat> and progressive nuclear weapon states. So, I wonder whether you can give us a sense of where these variations come from. Is it cultural? Is it uh, political? So I was looking for my micro button here. Um, well, yeah, that's a question we actually want to uh, investigate a bit more systematically. So everything I can say now is, is really speculation at this point. But there is, of course, a variation in terms of colonial histories, right? Um, with a major uh, difference between the U.S. I mean, if you look at Japan is a bit of a special case because uh, here it's not the state that has done the bombings, but actually the state that has uh, stepped in its place um, due to its own uh, fault in the war, due to the um, agreements in the San Francisco Peace Treaty um, that has set up this major compensation program. So if we leave that aside a little bit, also because it's a case related to nuclear use and conflict, um, there is a clear difference between um, the colonial histories of the US and uh, UK and France. Uh, particularly since the U.S. has initially tested uh, nuclear weapons in its own mainland and, and thus uh, has been forced to confront nuclear legacies as a as a domestic issue, right? And, um, and then once you have that um, domestic legislation, it is also more difficult to deny uh, at least a measure of compensation to uh, those much more affected outside the U.S. who have also, through the Compensation Act um, come into uh, the U.S. Um, and been admitted to to live in uh, in the U.S. So, lot Marshallese community is of course a very strong community in the U.S. And um, regarding the U.K., um, an interesting observation I think is that um, the U.K. seems to have a general problem with accountability for um, for past um, war crimes and violations. You see that also beyond the nuclear realm where despite being a member of the International Criminal Court, the UK government has done a lot of things to immunize its military personnel against any um, against any uh, lawsuits uh, pertaining to, to war crimes in various contexts. So I think there is a general culture of impunity issue here that um, I personally would like to investigate more about. Uh, but um, perhaps there are also people in the audience who you know have some something to contribute on this. Thanks. And unfortunately, I have to open the door. I think to one of my kids. I will return <laughs> right away. Sasha, what is your what is your view on this? 
Uh, my impression is actually that the U.S. case is among, uh, compared to the others, the exceptional uh, one because uh, this is actually the only nuclear weapon state that, like, more comprehensively uh, deals with the issue and has initiated a compensation program. So it certainly is related to like uh, uh, questions of democracy and minority rights and and the participation of them, but apparently not only. And if you compare it with the other nuclear weapon states democracies. Uh, uh, France and the UK in answer could be that the, the US has undertaken um, uh, nuclear tests, you know, on its mainland terri- authority. So it was more uh, less more difficult to to deny it or to, to kind of uh, keep uh, keep this issue uh, at a distance. So that might be uh, uh, an explanation, uh, especially if you compare it with France and the UK. What is but still surprising with the UK is that. Um, it does not even um, compensate its own military personnel. And this is like a, like even a, a puzzle, I would say. say. So recently there, there has been a relaunch of uh, legal action by um, uh, UK uh, veterans um, uh, and uh, descendants uh, fr- uh, from uh, um, uh, veterans or uh, military personnel that uh, has um, been engaged in those uh, nuclear weapons testing. Uh, and they don't, not only they um, didn't get compensation, but uh, they don't even have access to the information of medical examinations that have been undertaken. So, so this is really like um, an exceptional uh, case. Let me ask how uh, the relation with the TPNW, which is uh, um, something you bring up at the end. Uh, in the report, you talk about how the MPT fundamentally failed to deal with the nuclear legacy of the past, right? And it's uh, even in the in the language they use somehow, they do talk about the sort of like, you know, a symmetry of power, a symmetry of, uh, um, uh, of experiences, but it, there is a failure there for, you know, to recognize actually the cost and humanitarian environmental cost. So let me ask you, how do you think the TPNW has opened a space for studies like this? Uh, has it given you more credibility or more political visibility or more mo- momentum uh, where, you know, the, the question of transitional justice, uh, uh, reparation, cost, truth telling can actually come forward a little bit more? Yeah, actually, I think on the political level, um, the TPNW was even a main, or the, the community, the human initiative, the community behind the TPNW, so the non-nuclear weapon states, academic civil society that uh, promoted the treaty, uh, I would say they, they, they were a motor uh, for more research and uh, transparency and truth finding. Uh, you might remember the three and then the fourth conference on the human impact of nuclear weapons, uh, where they have given a lot of space for uh, victims' uh, testimonies, uh, but also uh, scientists uh, publishing the, uh, the results of the, the most recent re- research. So I think this has pushed this agenda um, a lot and is still uh, promoting um, uh, this uh, this issue also from a transitional or nuclear justice lens, I would say. Did your question relate to the to the TPNW or the NPT the, the, or the? I mean, I, I would say both. Is you know the yeah. TPNW, as you know, like now has mm. come up under fire, thinking that this is yeah. somehow is mutually exclusive to the NPT. I found it interesting how you phrase, you know, this NPT yeah. failing to acknowledge the nuclear past. And so I wanted to ask whether this new treaty really opens this new space. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Well, I think w- what it, it it's not only in the new treaty; it's also in statements given at the NPT that we see some some impact already of the norm building in the TPNW context. And I think um, what's interesting about this most recent uh, UN res- UN General Assembly resolution is that uh, really uh, the only no votes came from nuclear powers and uh, and all the. Uh, nuclear umbrella states that usually, um, you know, share the the line of their nuclear allies regarding the TPNW in this case uh, have come out in support of this resolution. So I do see uh, in this a bit of a, um, a norm building impact beyond the membership of the TPNW, at least on this aspect on on nuclear um, on nuclear victims and um, and their compensation and the need for further. Uh, truth seeking. Yep. 
You can even observe this actually at those uh, regarding the participants of the conference on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons as well, where the umbrella states were present. So they participated in the in the debate uh, on this as well. And uh, actually, the the members of the humanitarian initiatives and state parts of the TPNW were successfully or um, placed the issue within uh, the NPT outcome outcome document in two thousand. 10, which recognizes the catastrophic con consequences of nuclear weapons use, at least use, I'm not sure if the wording is also testing in this case. Oh. Uh, yeah, they keep the, the debate alive also in other forums like the NPT and the, the UN General Assembly, of course. Yeah, so I know I know you guys are working on an article right now that looks actually across different forms of justice. And of course, one of the really important ones, especially for the new generation, is both the environmental justice question and the racial and social question. Um, how do you think the transitional justice relates to these forms of justice that we would think immediately about when we think about nuclear test explosions? You would go immediately into the environmental cost with the minorities' uh, rights. So why using that framework and how does it actually help you then to reach out to other forms of justice that today are probably more prominent? Well, I think um, you can sort of, um, if you will, cross-tabulate um, the environmental perspective with all of the pillars as well. And this is what we try to talk through in this, in this article we're working on. So um, in terms of criminal liability, um, there is already uh, an environmental dimension to the ICC's war crimes definition. So even regardless of human harm to individual humans caused, uh, massive environmental damage would fall under ICC jurisdiction. Um, there are also proposals um, currently to include a crime of ecocide in the ICC statute. There are uh, proposals for specialized environmental crimes courts. And then when you look at state liability, not individual criminal liability, but state liability, um, there are already um, in principles of environmental law that have been used in, in cases against France by Australia and New Zealand. In this case, not to argue for compensation, but to argue for uh, stopping um, ongoing nuclear testing uh, that, uh, you know, that um, create a precedence yeah, that you could also use in future cases to to ask for compensation for environmental harm, um, and then uh, same um, 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 cross tabulation works for truth telling. For example, when it comes to assessing environmental impacts, um, there there is a lot of uh, need for further studies. There is a lot of denial surrounding um, environmental remediation. At, in as uh, the example that I think Sasha mentioned of this French. A strange exhibition at the UN where they claimed that they had really cleaned everything up <laughs> around their test sites. Um, and I think the exhibition was so embarrassing that the UN put a little sign next to it that this is only the opinion of the French mission. <laughs> was, um, and so I think there's there's a lot of um, work to do on on environmental truth telling, and uh, and of course it's 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 totally linked to the human dimension. Particularly, we had a, a delegation of a Marshall, uh, Marshallese Youth Initiative visiting at PRIF that talked about um, their perspective on these issues and they see these um, the human, social, and environmental dimension as, uh, of harm as being very much linked um, also um, due to the importance of the land uh, to the traditional culture of the Marshallese. And then again, it's also linked to other forms of environmental injustice, uh, clim climate change being the big issue here. And the Marshallese is now doubly affected by uh, you know, the environmental legacy of the testing and the environmental threat of climate change. And, and this is also being perceived as very much linked. Um, so I think um, there is a, a good conversation to be had between our framework and the environmental perspective without one replacing the other. Yeah, I would also say that conceptually, I would not at all oppose it or say, um, you know, uh, it, it, um, it should replace it or whatever. I think you cannot actually compare those different lenses because obviously they will not I don't think so, emerge like a huge transitional justice community <laughs> that uh, it's not so much a political tool, the transitional justice lens. I think its value added is the analytical tool because it links 
the different you know justice efforts and engagements um and uh, it is useful to analyze uh, uh, to to identify gaps uh, that, that that maybe would not be identified if you just focus on one uh, uh, perspective and it is also uh, useful just to operationalize um, uh, the uh, justice claims uh, so i would look at it much more instrumental than ideological um, actually it is very adaptive and flexible that's that's probably the main advantage can be adapted to 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 the uh, individual political context so I have I have a, a global governance question about this because uh, you are talking also about this need of an international norm norm building and in the report you actually talk about it, you suggest to go beyond these reparation programs uh, that it's necessary to build an institutional uh, very clear institutional approach to this and also memorializing efforts right so I want to ask uh, what kind of expertise would it take to implement this? And who do you think are the agents, the, the actors that could actually help us do this, to create a really a different institutional approach where justice victims are at the center of an approach to, um, you know, retribution, accountability, transparency. So in this specific geopolitical context, is it that something the UN could do? Or do you think we just need to go beyond the current institutions? Well, maybe um, I'll start. Sasha, you can jump in. We we did write a um, a blog post at one point in which we suggested that um, nuclear uh, powers should uh, voluntarily, maybe a bit naively or utopian, a utopian proposal, but that uh, nuclear powers or at least nuclear umbrella states should voluntarily make contributions to the trust fund for victims that's being set up under the umbrella of the TPNW. Perhaps that's too much of a a uh, political concession for these states to make. So um, it might be a good idea to um, create a trust fund outside the TPNW context under the UN, under some general UN umbrella. Um, but I think it, it would be important for the states who have actually caused the harm or benefited from the harm caused to voluntarily contribute here. And then I think we're not yet at the stage of um, concrete implementation, but it would have to be a system in which um, you know national uh, contact points would have to uh, report on the priorities they see in their societies uh, for their environmental um, legacies, and then um, find some system of of um, distributing claims there. I mean, similar probably to the Marshall Islands Nuclear Claims Tribunal which has uh, distributed some of the funds uh, provided by the US and more funds actually provided by the Marshallese government itself. Um, I, I, it's probably difficult to invent a global system of claims in which there's a global administration of these claims. But I think the, the global governance aspect would be to have a global norm, to have a fund to which the perpetrators contribute and to have um, a system of national contact points that then um, look at the specific implementation for their country. That's sort of the current answer I would have. Yeah, there is there is also, um, and then I want to take a question that is coming from the audience. Um, there is also a very interesting turn. Uh, some of the organizations, one in particular in the United Kingdom, BASICS, has done a fantastic work on nuclear responsibility. And the idea that increasingly nuclear weapon states, you know, compete with each other to define who is the most responsible. And so I think that could be something really important at the political level, you know, linking it to the nuclear legacy of the past. I mean, you are responsible not only about the future, but also what you, you have done, you know, before. Um, so perhaps there are there is a momentum that can be created there really to use the rhetoric that these countries themselves actually use um so let me take a question that comes from sylvia uh so sylvia is a fellow in our project on managing the atom she has done a lot of work on technology in particular and i wanted to ask you um really related to the the question she's raising how does technology in a way complicate the question of reparation and, uh, and and really nuclear justice. And she's asking, with the advancement of technology, we would perhaps be seeing nuclear armed state rely more, for example, on subcritical tests, critical mass experiments without having really to explode 
um, any specific device in the future. Um, in such a case, what are your thoughts and recommendations to strengthen the nuclear taboo on non-nuclear testing? You know, if you can't see, you can't necessarily regulate. And I think technology might actually give a leg up to many of these countries to continue certain practice without necessarily being more visible as they were in the past. So I think it's a really interesting question. How would you say, how would you, how do you think about, about this? Um, I mean, uh, obviously, nuclear, uh, the technology um, or the development of uh, new technologies uh, helps to sustain uh, those practices. Uh, at the same time, it is uh, also true that subcritical nuclear testing ob obviously does not produce the same uh, impact as uh, actual nuclear testing. So there is an ambiguity uh, uh, whether this is a progress or not. On the one hand, it has an enabled uh, states to stop this uh, practice, which is a big advance and, and progress. I mean, we are all, uh, I think, uh, very happy that uh, this uh, does not recur again, but it's true with regard to uh, the recurrence of nuclear use uh, uh, in the future. Uh, this means uh, a, a practice uh, is sustained that is actually not compatible uh, with non-recurrence. So uh, um, while a transitional justice uh, lens can, from an analytical point of view, say, okay, this is not compatible with efforts for non-recurrence, uh, but in what way it can be really uh, instrumentalized or used to, to actually stop this um, I. I, I doubt it, uh, to be honest, because I think the transitional justice um, agenda really depends on the support of the affected uh, people who are primarily concerned about uh, this, what has, what, what has happened uh, uh, to them, to their environment, uh, et cetera. So these would be like the problems or the challenges that would be tackled or dealt with in the first place. Uh, and I think it, it would take a long time that those uh, subcritical tests could be a topic for uh, uh, transitional justice to be put really uh, to the front. Mm. Yeah, just very particularly if you think about how even uh, obvious uh, 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 British veterans watching nuclear tests uh, face to face um, have have not so that, that situation has not forced the UK government to admit they have been exposed to any harm then it would be hard to imagine that an argument about subcritical tests could be successful in this, uh, in this vein. So I wanted to push you a little bit on, on a, a, a concept that I thought was very interesting, and it was the relation between nuclear deterrence and nuclear restraint. Um, so I think this is, this is really one of the core questions in my view, especially if you are a pro-nuclear deterrence person, that you would argue, well, listen, you know, if I didn't have nuclear deterrence, there will be no nuclear restraint, right? At the end of the day, it's only deterrence that is holding the countries from using, you know, all sorts of weapons, like it happened, for example, during, you know, World War II. And I think we are still looking uh, in the community to some arguments to push back convincingly against nuclear deterrence. And so I would like, I would like you guys to help us think through this, right? Um, I think you've said very clearly that for you, nuclear deterrence is non-compatible with non-recurrence. But if you are a pro-nuclear deterrence person, you would say, well, precisely because of deterrence, there will be probably no, no next use of nuclear weapons. So how do you, how do you think about this relation um, and how maybe transitional justice can help a little bit shed light onto, onto this, this quite important relationship? I mean, transitional justice let's, uh, uh, puts the focus, um, you know, away from from this uh, uh, functional uh, logic or a systemic logic of deterrence, and more like becomes um, or reformless translates it in more concrete terms. I mean, we said it's not compatible with recurrence because we threat. Uh, with recurrence of use of nu nuclear weapons, but you can also replace the term of recurrence with uh, the uh, uh, atrocities and crimes against humanity. So it is a threat uh, to commit atrocities and crimes against humanities. And uh, transitional justice can shed the light uh, um, 
on this aspect that uh, you you have to like substantialize what you are actually talking about of uh, nuclear uh, deterrence. It's not an abstract thing of uh, logical behavior. It's actually the threat of a concrete action, which is mass violence or mass murder. So this uh, would be like the transitional, the strong transitional argument against uh, the practice of nuclear deterrence. And I would also say that um, we do uh, phrase transitional justice and in, in our interpretation, nuclear justice in the report as a process rather than an ideal end state. And so um, transitional justice does question the underlying logic or the morality of, uh, um, of the underlying logic of nuclear deterrence very much as it's been questioned for decades by, by nuclear philosophers uh, like uh, Henry Shu or others. Um, so that's that's as such not innovative, but I think what it what it does is to provide an impulse to minimize really the role of deterrence and and uh, maximize the role of other forms of restraint to um, to prevent this from from happening again. So it, I think you don't need to radically say unless uh, you let go of any idea of um, nuclear deterrence we cannot discuss nuclear justice with you i think it's a it's a stark reminder as Sasha said of what it is that you're actually threatening a reminder of also the problem that once deterrence has failed uh, is it realistic that uh, democratic governments would then respond with um, committing another mass murder uh, that's that's a normative uh, constraint we are going to face in that situation. So it's a reminder of this and an impetus to to minimize deterrence and maximize um, other forms of restraint. So let me ask the question about memorializing efforts. I, I think this is a really fascinating space um, it, because it brings up, of course, some of the very specific questions. The first one is, what history are you going to showcase, right? And, and I think you you also in a way um you know question a little bit you know what is the definition of victim here right who is the victim in 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 situations where also the data are maybe like you know very limited but most importantly i have to say um you know when i traveled to hiroshima um a few times um i had the impression that the legacy was a little bit uh, a contradictory one in the sense that here is a city that has been renowned for this massive catastrophic, you know, humanitarian, uh, you know, attack and really a, a catastrophic past. But it's also a, it's a city now full of young people who want to pass that legacy. They want to go beyond that legacy and not just to be stuck in the past, right? Not to be remembered just as the city that got bombed with nuclear weapons. So I wonder how do we balance these memorializing efforts, right? So that we make sure that the cities or the countries are also not locked into this permanent status of victims. Um, because I think when I think about the Marshall Islands, I think about a country that also wants to move forward and have a very clear international presence. Uh, so how does memorializing helps you without necessarily locking these countries into a very specific status of victim? I think um, the the most important part, uh, like in from from this transitional uh, justice uh, perspective of memorizing and you know um, uh, reminding, gathering the facts, is actually sharing them, sharing them with those who uh, who are the perpetrators, but also sharing um, uh, them with the public. And by the recognition, there will there there comes an empowerment which is re which is linked to a, to an agency to uh, overcome actually um, uh, what has happened and, and, to, to, no, and to, to, to develop a new and uh, um, perspectives and, and, and evolve. Um, that's actually a, a, at least what, what was the goal also of the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, uh, indeed that uh, the victims don't get stuck in their victim's existence, but by sharing their experience and being acknowledged, they overcome the status of being a victims and and um, and acquire agency. So this would be the logic um, uh, that is most important. I think sharing and and recognition. Yeah, and I I think we can't stress enough that uh, the important uh, thing is 
to um, to see this transitional justice framework not as something pushed onto communities, but something they can use, you know, for to to uh, struggle for the things they want. And uh, it's interesting that you say um, perhaps one problem of this framework is that it sort of forces people to continue to um, to chew on <laughs> these old uh, uh, tragic um, events rather than move on. And a transition justice framework has also been confronted with the opposite criticism that you want to force people to uh, to reconcile, to move on, to leave things behind. You know, if that's just something that you're pushing on them. Maybe they don't want to uh, forgive. Maybe they want to move on. So uh, same um, problem, but uh, opposite criticism is transitional justice. Um, that's the joint um, uh, red line pushing something on people on affected communities they don't want. And that's really not the intention of this. Um, I think what's really interesting is to uh, to have a greater awareness of what communities want, um, what they study. It's it's interesting, for example, there's a new study on um, uh, demands by the Hibakusha and uh, that, that's finding um, that actually uh, it does make a difference to, to them whether uh, the state is uh, formally accepting its need to compensate them or not. And that wording makes a difference. So in some other um, contexts, that wording might not make so much of a difference. But I, I think it's important to listen what what people have to say. And the, uh, the post-colonial critique sometimes uh, of transitional justice sometimes says that it's too transactional, you know, this whole um, uh, redress and, and individual liability, that's not really solving the problem. But if it's if redress and individual liability is what the affected communities want, then I think um, we also have to accept this. Yeah. So um, we have in the last five minutes. I wanted to ask you as academics, as scholars, you know, you've said the truth telling is really important, more venues, more education. If one wants to think about, and I know we have some young scholars on online thinking about a research agenda for um, for transitional justice in, in, the, in the nuclear age, um, what are things that should be done in, in your view? What are some of the gaps that new research should fill, uh, maybe new data, new methods, uh, so if you are a young scholar interested in this topic, what are some of the, the topics you would, you would focus on? Well, I think it depends on uh, what discipline you're in, <laughs> as this is really a cross-disciplinary field, right? So um, so I'm a political scientist, and and so I'm, the questions that, uh, that I find fascinating that I'm planning to work on more are political science questions like explaining this variation in, um, in uh, compensation programs, comparing also um, the, the different movements for redress that, um, that have happened in, in different affected communities, how, how they've used different strategies, you know, what ha has made them more or less successful. Um, and also the the very issue of how this has has or has this first question has this actually already been transformed from a bilateral into a global governance issue? If so, what has driven this bilateral to global process? Um, so these are some some um, political science questions and the very empirical descriptive question. As I said, what communities want? What uh, framing of um, of justice uh, makes a difference to them. Um, what wording uh, of of um, apologies of official narratives uh, do they wish? Um, just just investing knowing more about this. And then of course there's a huge research agenda in the natural sciences that is being pursued on the impacts of nuclear testing on who's been affected. There's work for historians to do regarding information that is slowly getting declassified about the impacts of, um, of nuclear testing and so forth. So th these are just some ideas. And there's work for international lawyers you know, to, to find out whether there are opportunities for strategic litigation and um, and lots of more <laughs> questions, but Sasha has. 
Yeah, it also depends on the regional focus. I mean, we um, we noticed that there are huge differences of knowledge between what have, has happened between the different nuclear weapon states. So obviously someone who has profound regional knowledge or la language knowledge uh, in Chinese, it would be very interesting what you can actually find out. We, do, we might not know because, you know, there's also a language a border and a border of cultural knowledge, regional knowledge, perhaps it is possible to some extent to have access to people who are actually affected. Uh, I do not know. Um, uh, I know that in Russia, there, uh, there, it is possible. There are groups of activists um, uh, with regard to legacy uh, uh, of, uh, you know, radioactivity. Um, so someone who is uh, more connected culturally and 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 more skilled in language might uh, have uh, opportunities to, to fill a, a knowledge and information gap here. We also uh, said that the UK actually is also a, a country that is probably under uh, studied or not not enough uh, examined. So there is a lot of opportunity. And finally, I think. Um, uh, especially with regard to how to operationalize uh, transitional uh, justice, I see a close connection uh, with post-colonial uh, studies, because if we want to see in the future truth and commission also dealing with the nuclear legacy uh, issue, it will be, it probably would be incorporated uh, in a uh, in such a commission who deals with uh, a colonial uh, legacy. I, I don't see a nuclear weapons uh, specific uh, commission. So um, this would also be interested, uh, interesting to um, explore the opportunities of uh, truth finding, not only on an empirical level, but also on the social uh, level uh, in frameworks such as truth commissions or even others uh, in linkage to um, dealing with the legacy of the colonial past, especially with regard to France, which is taking initiatives on this side, but none on the nuclear side. So is it possible to connect the both and through this have a win-win situation. This is terrific. I want to really to thank you, Caroline and Sasha, for coming. I want to flag again for our audience, uh, the report Beyond the Ban, a Global Agenda for Nuclear Justice is available online. I know that you are working on an article. I hope you will come back to present some of the variation uh, elements. We will be very interested in following again with you your work, I think this is really uh, terrific and really important. Uh, we'll have really important, in my view, uh, implications also for how we think about justice in the future. Uh, to all of you, thank you so much for staying. We have recorded the event. We will post it online. We hope J Jana will, will uh, recover soon and maybe we can invite her again for another, for another event, uh, maybe more focused on nuclear testing. And again, thank you so much for your work, guys. And thank you all. Happy holidays, wherever you are. We will resume next year with another series of Atomic Voices. Thank you again, Caroline, Sasha, and have a good evening.